Well, this has been uh, just wonderful, um, a wonderful treat. And what we did in anticipation of this opportunity <clears throat> is really ask people for some questions. So we have questions from people all over the world. Great. But since you just began with something quite like lighthearted, I have a lighthearted question for you. So Gail Hutchings from Virginia wants to know, what is your guilty pleasure? <laughs> Uh, let's see. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Are there that many? <laughs> well, I'm just trying to think of, you know, the G-rated ones. No, I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, look, chocolate. I mean, I hate to be so predictable. Chocolate of any sort. I have finally just stopped keeping it in the house because... You know how you read these articles that if you have just a square of <laughs> yeah. 70 or 80% yeah. cocoa yes. intense chocolate, it's like good for your brain, it's good for your heart. <laughs> I never can stop with one square, so that's my guilty pleasure. Got it, got it. So we have a, a lot of young people also. We actually have a young leaders program that is here. A lot of young women, you are a phenomenal role model. We've heard you say you have to play an inside and an outside game if you're a woman who wants to move up. What do you mean by that? Well, I, I, this is probably the most common set of questions that I'm asked, particularly by young women uh, at college campuses and elsewhere, uh, because so many of them, it's not that they want to go into politics, but they want to be active in the public arena. Maybe they want to be an advocate for mental health. They want to do something that takes them out of their comfort zone as they see it. So I basically try to explain to them what I have learned over years of you know, trial and error, uh, picking myself up and, and going back uh, into the arena. First of all, you really have to be very clear about what your purpose is, what your mission is, what you're trying to accomplish. And it can change over time. But in the immediate, what is it you want to achieve? And how do you get best prepared for that? Obviously, education and experience, the two E's, are essential. How do you acquire that education and that experience? But then you have to marry that with some of the less easily uh, explained attributes, like confidence, um, whether it's speaking in public or presenting yourself. Uh, and so the inside game, as I think about it, is really the internal preparation that you and only you can do for yourself. Others can give you advice, and I'm a strong believer in seeking out advice. I also love what Eleanor Roosevelt wrote back in the 1920s. She said, if you want to pursue a life in public, you have to grow skin as thick as the hide of a rhinoceros. <laughs> and I think she understood that you will, uh, and this is true for men as well as women, but I think there are some special uh, issues about women still today going into the public arena. You have to be prepared for criticism. And some of it will be totally unfair, unjustified, um, maybe um, you know, badly motivated, uh, because it's about somebody else, not about you, really. But at the same time, I always say you have to take criticism seriously, but not personally. And by that, I mean you can learn from your critics. Sometimes your critics will say things, for whatever reason, that your friends will not tell you. <laughs> um, so you do want to take it seriously and kind of put it through a filter, see if there's something to learn from it. But don't take it personally. Don't be crushed by criticism. And for many young women, it goes hand in hand with the overwhelming pressure to be perfect. You know, the perfectionist gene. You have to look perfect. You have to act perfect. You have to be perfect. And that is very paralyzing for a lot of young women. And I kid my staff, and I've said this in public, I've, by this stage in my professional life, I've had many young uh, employees. And whenever I've said to a young woman, you know, I'd like to give you, uh, you know, more responsibilities, or I think you could move on to a, a more um, responsible managerial position. Inevitably, the answer is something like, do you really think so? Or, I'm not sure, or, 
I, not, I don't think I can do that. It's always a kind of doubtful response. Now, maybe that's just being polite, and women are taught to be polite. But honestly, I've never heard that from a young man. I want to move you on. Well, what took you so long? <laughs> really, come on. I mean, I've been here. I've been working hard. But I think, it, I think it's part of the, again, it's part of the internal dialogue you've got to have with yourself. And if you have trusted friends, peers, mentors, with them as well. Then the outside, the outside game, so to speak, is you just have to be as well prepared as you possibly can because it's going to require you to be agile and flexible and, and think on your feet and all the rest of it. And, and there still is a double standard, let's face it. Um, it's not fair, but lots of life is not fair. You just have to be prepared to deal with it. Um, and it's something that I've seen lots of um, women master very well, and others get totally flummoxed. You know, they just can't quite figure out how to present themselves or how to deal with the incoming negativity or whatever. So I think there still is a, a, a lot of room for some very constructive conversation around this issue, Linda. So let me follow that up with a question uh, from Jeannie Campbell, our executive vice president from your home state in Arkansas. When you were first lady, um, you could have made a lot of choices about what you're going to focus on, road beautification, literacy. You chose health care. How did you make that decision? Um, and why? How, how did what you did set the stage for the ACA? And then how would you recover from the beating you took? <laughs> well, since she's from Arkansas, back in, <clears throat> back in Arkansas when Bill was governor, I was practicing law full time, but I was also very active um, in the state and, and charitable activities and other kinds of um, issues. And when Bill was reelected uh, in 1982, after losing in 1980, He's, he didn't feel like he had any time to waste, and he wanted to do whatever we could to improve the education system uh, in our state then. So he uh, asked me if I would chair a commission to make recommendations on improving education. And at the same time, he began to tackle some of the incredible health disparities that we had. You know, it, 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 it was historically a poor state, but there were some parts of it that were incredibly deprived, did not have medical professionals, doctors, nurses. It just was in a really sad situation. So between the work that I did on education and my constant traveling around the state, I saw the injustice in health care disparity and what being uninsured meant in not just our state, but in America. So when Bill became president, he inherited a budget deficit, and he was trying to figure out how to stimulate the economy, get it moving, create growth. But he realized that if we didn't tackle health care, it would be uh, a great missed opportunity in terms of helping people, but also in terms of beginning the process of trying to bring down both health care disparity and health care costs. So he asked me if I would share the health care efforts, just like I had shared the education efforts. Who knew that Washington <laughs> was so much more conservative when it came to women especially first ladies doing things like this than Arkansas. Yeah. I, I mean, really, I, I couldn't quite get my head around it. And, you know, I mean, we, we had a very controversial education reform, but it was never personalized. It was, we don't agree with you, we agree with you. It was back and forth. So I step into this role, and shortly after <clears throat> he asked me, we had the nation's governors at the White House, and Mario Cuomo, the father of the current governor in New York, Andrew Cuomo was then governor, and he comes up to me, he goes, I can't tell whether your husband really likes you or really hates you. <laughs> I said, well, it depends about the day, Mario. I don't know. Um, but it, 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 it was so controversial from the very beginning. And, and frankly, it was, a, it was a labor of love on my part because I just thought it was so wrong. I mean, if you, well, you all do. This is an audience of people who know that. When you meet people who are suffering, I mean, the numbers of Americans who I met personally, who sent me letters, whose stories I heard, 
was just overwhelming in the pain and the suffering and the lost opportunities that they were experiencing. So we took it on, and it was incredibly political from the get-go, and we didn't have enough Democratic votes to, to pass it, um, obviously. And it was, but there were a lot of the ideas, the, the threads that kept going. And so we totally got shut down uh, in 94. It uh, was um, a political firestorm. But a few years later, we were able to pass the Children's Health Insurance Program because we sort of laid the foundation and we could go in. I worked with Senator Kennedy and others in saying to members of Congress, OK, you, you don't want to insure everybody, but how about insuring those kids who are not eligible for Medicaid, but their parents don't have insurance, and literally they can't get a physical exam because the parents don't have the money to pay for it. A lot of them are not able to do sports even because of that. So we got the Children's Health Insurance Program, and we began to slowly chip away at some of the other inequities. And therefore, when um, you know, President Obama made it a priority and was able to put together the votes in that uh, first uh, two years of his first term, uh, I was incredibly um, relieved and, and very happy. And I knew it was going to be controversial. And I knew that it would continue to be controversial. Social Security was, Medicare was, Medicaid was. I was senator when the Medicare Part D drug benefit uh, for our seniors passed, and it was so controversial at that time, and a lot of the seniors didn't understand it, and they didn't know what to do with it, and we worked and worked and, and, and made it possible for them. And that's what I hope happens with the Affordable Care Act. If there are problems, and with any big piece of legislation, there are going to be problems. But here's what I don't understand. I do not understand how any elected official can turn down the opportunity to have the federal government pay <laughs> right. for Medicaid <laughs> and and, and what and, and what we're trying to do is to expand coverage to people who either were already eligible but didn't know it or now right. are eligible and and are not being given the opportunity to sign up. I don't, I don't know <clears throat> why those elected officials are letting politics drive what is a good deal for their states. This is a smart investment that will help people, but it will also help their hospitals, it will help their That's providers, right. it will help their community health centers of all kinds. I don't get that. I see it as a strictly political partisan decision. And I regret that because I think we can do better, and I hope that there will be some minds changed over time. Could we go underneath that just a bit? Um, besides it being a strictly political decision, why do you think the people in that state, those who understand it, are so reluctant to force the issue and think that if poor people get something, they're going to lose something? And how do we deal with that? Well, I think there are three three answers to that, Linda. First, in some of the states, well, let's just take Texas, for example. Um, <laughs> We've been picking on them a lot in this well, conference. It's, I love Texas, and I yeah. love Texans, but I, I think it's, it's a perfect example because you can compare it to California, you know, size-wise, diversity-wise. Part of it is that people in Texas, particularly African Americans, Hispanic, poor whites, have never voted in the percentage that their, let's say, comparative populations have voted in California. If African Americans and Hispanics in Texas voted at the same percent as they vote in California, you would have different political leadership in many parts of Texas, for example. So, and I, you know, and so if, if you don't have that ethos of citizenship, and these, I'm obviously talking about citizens, people who understand how connected their lives are to the decisions their political leaders make, that makes it harder. Secondly, I do think that if you tell people something long enough with great passion, they get perhaps inclined to believe it. 
And there's so much misinformation about the Affordable Care Act, the economic stimulus, you name it, all of these big political issues. And there is a very effective campaign to confuse and provide a different reality, if you will. And, and you can't blame people if they're leaders and certain of the either media is fully participating or they are in the one hand, the other hand mode. Like, you know, you have a representative who is on the TV show who says the world is round and they feel compelled to bring somebody from the Flat Earth Society instead of saying, <laughs> guess what, it is, right? Okay, maybe a little elliptical, <laughs> but it's mostly round. And so <laughs> you, you get this, this, this relentless campaign. Now, who's behind that? Well, it's it, people who are just anti-government, and we've had those kinds in our sure. country forever. People who have political access to grind, commercial interests to protect and further, uh, whose ideologies are just at odds with helping other people, who really live in this um, rugged individualist mentality, except when they need help. <laughs> um, and I'm always, I mean, I'm always amazed when I, when I see some of the people on uh, TV who are ranting and railing, and then if you really investigate, as I've had occasion to do a few times, <laughs> and you find out that person had a federally insured college loan, <laughs> that person may have gotten an SBA loan, that person certainly rides to work on federally funded highways. You go down the list. And you think, wait a minute, why is it they want to prevent other people from getting right. their basic needs met? And then finally, I think it's just um, the, the atmosphere in which we find ourselves right now. We're, we really need to just switch gears a little bit and start rebuilding the American community. We are so divided. We are so um, set against one another. And people don't even get to know each other across political lines. Everybody kind of just comes together in the, what one author says is the big sort. You know, we live with our own kind. We vote like they do. We're very comfortable not having to deal with people who we disagree with. And maybe that's because, you know, we don't have like small towns and cities where everybody's mixed up like they used to be. But whatever the reason, we have to overcome that. And we have to get back to really listening to each other. People on the other side are not all wrong. They do have legitimate yeah. concerns. They have legitimate questions. And I just want to get back to evidence-based decision making. <laughs> uh, that's my goal. <laughs> Good answer. Good answer. So um, Jeff Richardson from Maryland, one of our board members, um, had a question for you. You've had to make some very big decisions about what you were going to do next in your life. You have another one coming up. And, and you can tell us, by the way. We won't tell anybody. <laughs> no? Well, as, as long as it's within the privilege. Only here, yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, you, uh, so when you made those decisions, particularly when you chose to become Secretary of State and you made the president look Lincoln-esque, how do you make those decisions? And when you take on challenges like that and running for president, what are you giving up in your life? Well, that's a great question, because obviously I'm thinking about that right now. <laughs> um, I, uh, Okay, I will try to <laughs> briefly describe <laughs> sort of decision making. I'll start though with the decision to run for the Senate. I did not ever think I personally would run for elected office. I loved doing policy. Um, I loved trying to make things better for people. I worked for the Children's Defense Fund with Marion Wright Edelman. I chaired the Legal Services Corporation. I started a wonderful group in Arkansas called Arkansas Advocates for Children and Families. I was always an advocate, and I loved that work, and I really thought that was my highest and best use. And in, uh, after the 1998 midterm election, um, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan announced that he was not going to run in 2000 again. 
And almost before the words were out of his mouth, people from New York were calling me and saying, we really would love for you to run. I said, that's ridiculous. I usually start decisions I end up making by saying, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and so I, I said that, you know, real, uh, thank you so much. You know, I love New York. I, and Bill and I had already talked about, you know, living in New York when we got out of the White House and obviously also in Arkansas where uh, the Clinton Presidential uh, Center is. I invite everybody to come visit. Um, and so I kept saying no. And I mean, delegations of my friends, people that I had known for years were coming and saying, we really want you to run. Now, I knew enough about politics to realize that they were having trouble recruiting any other Democrat. <laughs> because at the time, Mayor Rudy Giuliani was running. And people were a little nervous about running against the mayor. Uh, and so they were trying to find somebody that they could put into the race. And uh, I kept saying, no, 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 no. And you know, it was, it was flattering, I was honored, but it was not gonna happen in my, in my mind. And then, I have to tell you, this was one of these little aha moments. I was actually in New York City at a, at a high school in Chelsea. <laughs> which I guess was an omen. <laughs> and I was there to promote a, an HBO documentary about women in sports, because I had loved sports growing up. I was really bad, but I played softball, and I, I played everything, but I was tolerated by my teammates. But I really believed in sports for girls as well as boys. So the name of this um, series was called Dare to Compete. So the young woman who introduced me, she was cap captain of the basketball team, this really attractive, young, vibrant woman. She introduced me, and I went over, she was at the podium, and I went, stuck out my hand to shake her hand, to thank her, and she bent down. She was considerably taller than I am. <laughs> she bent down, and she whispers in my ear, dare to compete, Mrs. Clinton, dare to compete. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And, and then I started thinking, like, oh my gosh, I mean, I've gone around for years telling young women, compete, you know, make your own way in life, stand up for yourself, and all the rest of that. And I'd urged so many young women, and, and not so young women, to run for office. I'd supported them, I'd raised money for them, I'd campaigned for them. And I slowly inched my way toward making the decision, but I had to really let it percolate, because it was, it, it was hard to do. I mean, I'd never done it before. And I was perfectly happy saying, vote for him, vote for her. <laughs> it was hard to say, vote for me. <laughs> that, that was, that, you know, for a while, my, my, my staff, who, you know, I, I started my campaign in July of 1999 on, on Senator Moynihan's farm. He graciously introduced oh, me. Oh, and right. after it was over, my staff said, who's the candidate? <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean? They said, we have to start talking about yourself. I said, oh, I don't want to do that very much. You know? So it took a while and slowly but surely. So fast forward, um, after the end of the 2008 primary, which had been so hard fought and, and, and so exhausting, really, I, I, I write about this in my book. I have a book coming out in June, which starts with the decision to um, accept the president's offer. I basically, thought, you know, I will campaign and, and help uh, uh, then Senator Obama be elected and then go back to the Senate because I loved, loved, loved representing New York in the Senate. So shortly after the election, the president reaches out to me and he starts talking to me about, well, doesn't talk to me, asks me if I would be his Secretary of State. And I said, oh, no, 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 that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> these other people and I'm throwing names and they're, oh no no he says I want you I want you I said well, I, you know I can't do it. I, I just can't do it Mr. President elect I can't do it I, I'm going back to the Senate well think about it no. anyway this goes on as I uh, detail in my book and um, finally I, I, I had sort of the same kind of coming to terms uh, experience with myself it was like you know, suppose the shoes had been reversed and I was the president-elect and I was facing all of these horrible problems like this great recession and two wars and everything that the new president was going to be facing. All the things we'd inherited and, and, and I, I thought, well, suppose I'd asked him, what would I want him to say? So I worked my way again through the process un, until I found, you know, the words to say, yes, I will. It, it's, 
for me, I, I am somebody who has to really mull things over. It's over. Um, because there is a cost to everything. And for me, um, it's, you know, it, it is exciting to be in the public arena, trying to do what I can to influence the public debate, to speak out for people who may not have voices on their behalf. So I really appreciate doing all of that. I just have to decide whether I'm, I'm ready to do that. Um, so stay tuned. We'll, <laughs> we will. When, when I know, you'll know. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see you're going to have a lot of volunteers um, in this audience. <laughs> To, to go back uh, to mental health ju just a little bit, you talked about suicide and the work the foundation's doing. Um, when you were first lady, I remember back, there was the suicide of someone fairly close to you. And it's always easier in retrospect. But looking back, are there other things you or other people close to him could have done that you know now and that you think we all need to be on the alert about in those situations? Well, obviously, I've thought a lot about that. I've known several people um, in the last 40 plus years who have committed uh, suicide. And they appeared to be very different personalities on the surface. So I, I've never been able to draw like hard and fast rules. Um, I think the, the ones that I've personally known were all men. And <clears throat> I think that particularly in the case you're talking about, I think there was a reluctance to seek help. Yeah. We, we knew after the terrible fact that he'd been depressed, he'd been really just filled with all kinds of doubts and anxieties and, you know, suicidal thoughts, and had not talked to anybody, not sought out a professional, although it came to light afterwards that he'd actually called somebody and got an appointment for, uh, you know, I think the next week, uh, as I recall. You know, I think that even then, 20, you know, plus years ago, there was still a stigma. There was still a um, sense among high-functioning people, because the people I've, I've known who've killed themselves have all been really high-functioning, very successful. I think that the, um, the fact for them was that they did not want to be seen as weak. They didn't want to admit their problems. You know, after our friend um, in, the, in the White House killed himself, we, uh, we had a visit from a, a guy that we knew socially, another one of these really high-functioning people, who came to see us and said, look, I just want to tell you that 10 years ago that could have and would have been me. I made up my mind. He was an incredibly successful financial uh, guy in New York, and he said, I'd made up my mind that I was going to kill myself that night, and I was literally walking to the place where I was going to do it, and I ran into a friend who I hadn't seen for a while, and the friend was like, how you doing? Come, you got to have a cup of coffee. It's a, and he said, it, it, it broke the, you know, it, it broke my, my will to kill myself. It was just that simple. So I, you know, I don't know what are the various interventions, sensitivities, support. Uh, if someone says that they're thinking about it, we now know you need to take that seriously. You can't say, oh, yeah, right, and just ignore it. But most of the people I've personally known have never said that. And, and you know, the first person I knew who, who killed himself was I was teaching law at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. And, he was this incredibly charismatic, unbelievably talented writer and poet, and he shot himself twice in the heart. And all of us who knew him were just angry. You know, we, we just, we, we couldn't come to grips with what he had done, and we were all just really mad at him. Like, you know, what did, how could you do that? And he had never given any indication. We were not sophisticated. We weren't like many of you in this audience who might have picked up signs and all the rest of it. 
you know, now I think you can pick up some patterns, changes in behavior and the like. But I think we're still really at the beginning of trying to understand yeah. how, to, how to deal with it and how to prevent it. A follow-up to that, um, and that question was asked by Linda Legenza from South Carolina. A follow-up to that is you mentioned men and you mentioned completed suicides and you even mentioned a gun. Um, restriction of means is a very big issue. Gun control, we saw it emerge in Congress this year and go nowhere. If you were to run, if you were to be elected, <laughs> um, is that an issue that's important and where do you think we can go with that? Well, I, I, you know, I won't answer it based on the hypothetical you posed. I'll just <laughs> basically say I dropped. Um, that I think, again, we're way out of balance. Um, I think that we've got to rein in what has become a, a almost article of faith that anybody can have a gun anywhere, anytime. And I don't believe that is in the best interests of the um, vast majority of people. And I think you can say that and still support the right of people to own guns, but there's got to be a better appreciation, to go back to what I said in my remarks, about the stresses and the kind of hair trigger feelings that so many people are walking around with today. Mm. I mean, look at the kinds of things that have caused people who are carrying guns in public places to respond. Loud music from a bunch of kids, uh, somebody Text knocking messaging. on your door, seeking help, losing you know, their way at night, you know, an argument with a neighbor. I mean, let, let's just take a deep breath here and realize that we're living at a time when there's so much external stimulation and so much internal confusion in certain people that to arm everybody and let them go to bars with guns, let them go to schools with guns, let them go to church with guns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when that can unfortunately give someone the means to respond in the moment in a way that he wouldn't if a few minutes passed and there was no means to inflict harm. So how we do this, we're, we really have got to get our arms around it because at the rate we're going, we're going to have so many people with guns everywhere, fully licensed, fully validated, in settings where they can be in a movie theater and they don't like somebody chewing gum loudly or talking on their cell phone and decide they have a perfect right to defend themselves against the gum chewer and the cell phone <laughs> user by shooting the person. I mean, that, that's what happens in the countries I visited where there's no rule of law and there's no self-control. And that is something that we cannot <clears throat> just let go without paying attention. <clears throat> So uh, I have a signal now that it's a last question and we could keep you all day <laughs> if we were allowed to. But um, Rich LeClaire from R Rhode Island had a question. What role do you think Congress should play in naming your grandchild? <laughs> well, given what's going on, the poor child would never get a name. <laughs> It would, it would, you know, be, be baby until, you know, he or she went to college and could probably choose it for themselves. So a really a more serious last question from John Cherry from Florida. You touched on this, and that's income inequality, which is growing in this country, has huge implications for people with disabilities, right. including people with serious <coughs> mental illness. Right. How are we going to address that? You address, you address it across the globe, actually, but we can't seem to do it here. What do you think? Well, I, I, I think first we have to create a consensus about what works in our country to produce growth, because you want to grow the pie, and you want more people to have their piece of it. And I would commend, my husband gave a speech at Georgetown last week where he talked about the economic choices he made as president, and they were difficult, and they, you know, he lost the Congress in uh, 1994, in part because of that, and in part because of gun control. 
um, where he banned assault weapons until the ban expired. Um, and so he talks about what works and what doesn't work. And if you want to lift people out of poverty, trickle-down economics does not work. Supply-side economics right. does not work. You've got to have a sensible combination of the revenues you need to meet the needs of people and the uh, spending cuts that you should have to discipline your process to make sure that you're being as careful as possible with uh, the taxpayer dollar. And so if you look at what Bill did, and if you compare his eight years to the eight years of, the, of President Reagan's two terms, it's pretty astonishing, because President Reagan cut taxes incredibly low based on the prior base. And in his eight years, the best we can determine, about 77,000 people got out of poverty. In Bill's eight years, 7.7 .7 million wow. people got out of poverty. Wow. And so, and 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 this is you know this is this is not a this is not a political statement. Obviously, it has political implications. Let's just start looking at the facts. So you know when someone stands up and says, "We have to cut taxes for what they call the wealth creators, which are the really really rich people among us." What's the evidence for that? Really, show, show us the evidence. You know, at some point, what has always marked our country is that we are not driven by ideology or theocracy. We try to be pretty pragmatic people, which is one of our great advantages uh, in the world and continues to be in the 21st century. So let's really put people to the test of proof. And I often tell groups, because I'm often asked, you know, what can we do about the political dysfunction? Well, first of all, do not, I don't care whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, a Libertarian, I don't care what you are. Don't vote for someone who proudly says he or she will never compromise. Because in a democracy, I mean, that, that's the way they are in Iran, and that's increasingly the way Putin is in Russia. You don't, you, you, there's no space to compromise. In our country, unless we believe that a certain group of people have all the truth, and therefore what they say should be followed as though it were scripture, you gotta compromise. You, you know, you give a little to get something, and that's the way our system has survived, the longest surviving democracy in the world. Secondly, don't give them any money. You know, find somebody of your party who's sensible, who understands the legislative process, who's not going to Washington proudly to destroy what our founders built because they have a better idea about how to run our country. Um, and then thirdly, it's very difficult for um, our current political leaders, particularly members of Congress, to get to know each other to build any trust with each other. They see each other as stereotypes. You know, there's, you know, Joe, he believes that. There's Sam, he believes that. Mary believes that. Susan believes that. And if you don't get to know somebody, it's really hard to compromise. It's really hard to work together. You can't build the trust that is the glue of any democratic society. So I, I think that the mad chase for dollars in the political campaign, our fundraising, necessities that people feel when they're running for and holding office really keep people out of Washington. They show up Monday night or Tuesday morning. Uh, they leave Thursday if they can, so they can get back to their districts, they can go to fundraisers, they can do all of that. And so they don't ever connect the way they used to. You know, the way people used to cross party lines all the time in this town and get to know each other. And I think we did a lot of good things. You know, it, you know we, we did a lot of good things for our people and for the world when we had the idea, yes, have your strong principles, stand on your convictions, but you're a legislator, so you're going to have to listen to other people, get to know them, and try to figure out a way to keep solving the problems that our country faces. So I think there's, there's things we can do and things we're gonna have to do if we wanna get back to 
you know, we, look, it's, it's part of the American DNA to dislike politics, politicians, <laughs> um, legislators, all of that. That's kind of, and, and that's good. That skepticism is good. It, it keeps people on their toes. But I think we've gone so far now that we're in a dysfunctional state, and we need to sort of retreat back to being a more workable um, body politic, and that's what I would hope for. Thank you so much, Madam Secretary. <laughs> You've been phenomenal. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. Thank you. Really. Thank you all. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you Amazing. so much. Thank you. You are wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.